1 Samuel chapter 22. Begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. When his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And every one that was in distress, and every one that was in debt, and every one that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We're thankful you're faithful and true. Lord, we're thankful we can come to your house this morning and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we're glad we can bow these unworthy heads and lift up holy hands toward heaven and proclaim that, Lord, you are the greatest thing that ever happened to us. Now, Lord, as we assemble here this morning, we realize... In a congregation this size, there are many needs, but we're glad, God, you're able to meet every need. God, nothing is impossible with thee. Lord, if there's somebody here today unsaved, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. Father, if there's somebody here today that is seeking truth, I pray you'd reveal yourself. Lord, if there's somebody here today in the valley, I pray that the lily of the valley would become sweet unto them. Father, if there's somebody here on the mountaintop, I pray you'd give them another uh, uh, log on their fire and help them to enjoy the blessings of the mountaintop. Father, if there's somebody here not well in body, I pray you would touch them and heal them. Father, if there's somebody here today who is uh, discouraged, I pray you would encourage them. Father, if there's somebody here today who is seeking, I pray they would find in the Lord Jesus exactly what they need. Uh, and Father, any other need that someone is faced with here today, we pray the perfect will of God for their lives. Uh, now, Father, I pray you'd use this unworthy vessel. Lord, you'd help us today to lean on thine understanding. Put a watch guard about my lips. Help me not to say anything contrary to the word or will of God. Uh, but God, help me to say everything that you'd have me to, that your people might be edified, that they might be encouraged, enlightened to truth, uh, that God the gospel would spring forth, that sinners would be saved, that revival would break out, and that Jesus would be glorified through it all. Now, Father, uh, get glory now to your name. Help us, Lord. Arrest our attention now. Bind the powers of hell. And, Father, we'll bless you for what you do, for it's in the holy name of Jesus we do pray. Amen and amen. Not that this has anything to do with the message, but I don't know if you watched the convention this week. Wasn't it amazing that people supposedly opened in prayer and they had to sit there and read off a teleprompter? That amazed me. One man, and I'm not a big advocate of him, but I do appreciate that he told Larry King how to be saved, and I do appreciate he's told a lot of people how to be saved. Uh, uh, one man bowed his head and prayed. That was Franklin Graham. Hmm? Just thought I'd throw that out anyway. I just got done praying. I got thinking about that. Huh? I thought prayers when we talk to God, not to a teleprompter. Huh? It amazes me. You go to these graduations and people get up there and got to read their prayers. Huh? Lord, have mercy. I'm glad, hallelujah, that through the Holy Ghost... That's what Romans 8 tells us. The Holy Ghost intercedes because a lot of times even the words we say aren't right, but he intercedes what's in our heart to the Father. Well, anyway, that's old. I don't know why I got on that. Why would you get me on that, Brother Eddie? Straight up, huh? 1 Samuel chapter 22. I want you to notice a couple things from this thought. First of all, I want you to notice David's banishment we find that it starts out by saying David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam now I'll be honest with you I was reading 1 Samuel 21 uh, this week and I love 1 Samuel 21 one of my favorite messages God ever gave me is in 1 Samuel 21 
when David is on the run, when Saul has uh, sought to take David's life, uh, and David is warned by Saul's son Jonathan in the middle of the night, and David leaves out, uh, and he comes down to a, a, a little synagogue, and uh, there, there's a man there, and David tells him he's on a business and haste to the king, uh, and they left without anything to eat, and they were given showbread to eat, uh, uh, some stale bread, and then David asked him, he said, do you have any swords, any spears, any weapons here? And the priest says, none save one. He said, wrapped up behind the ephod, behind the altar, is the sword of Goliath. He said, if you want it, take it. And David comments about that sword. He said, no, 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 think about this. David is long removed from being the shepherd boy. David is long removed from slaying Goliath. David has went on to become a warrior for Israel. As a matter of fact, that's one reason Saul wanted to kill him. He was jealous because the people would cry, Saul has his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. David's been given Saul's daughter to marry. I mean, David has reached the pinnacle, but now he's on a path where he is fleeing for his very life. And now he's confronted with the sword that started it all. And David said, give it me. Now go read it. He didn't say give it to me. He said give it me. And the message I preach out of that text is uh, that sword was proven in David's life and we need to give ourselves to those things that are proven. I love that message. And I was just reading through there and was enjoying that, that story, that text once again. And the Lord wouldn't let me quit. And I get over here to chapter 22 and we got, he is now banished to the cave Adullam. Notice, if you will, David's brethren. The Bible says in verse number 1, And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. Can I just say this on a side note? No matter what you're doing for God, if you're living for God, if you're not living for God, there will always be people who follow you. It's very important. You are impacting somebody's life. The Bible said we are written epistles known and read of all men. Good or bad, people will take your advice and people will follow you. We see his brethren, we see his banishment. But notice his band. Boy, this is a great crowd. Look at them in verse number 2. And everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. What a crowd. He's got a bunch of folks that are stressed out, that are in debt to their eyeballs, and that are rebels. They're discontent with everything going on. What a crowd. Hmm? Uh, think, wow, what's he going to do with that mess? Well, the truth of the matter is, David goes on to do great things with this crowd. But I'm interested in this cave Adullam. I want you to notice this cave can I say, first of all, it's a place of desperation. You notice who all ended up there? David fleeing from the king. He's got a wanted poster out everywhere with his name on it where the king wants him dead. And then you got folks that are stressed out, folks in debt, folks that are discontented. It seems like the band that nobody else wants ends up there. Hmm? Isn't it amazing? How many times are church people are going to be called deplorable, non-essential. I mean, really, look at us, though. What do we really have to offer? We're a bunch of nobodies. Hmm? It's a place of desperation. Can I say something else about this cave adulum? It's a place of darkness. I don't know about you, but I've never went into a well-lit cave. Hmm? Can I say the valley may be low, 
But at least the sun does hit the valley. The cave's lower than the valley. But can I say this cave would also become a cave of destiny. Now, depending on what language, Hebrew, Aramaic, Old Syriac, what language you look at, Adulam means something different. You know I'm big on names. You know that names have a significance, the meaning behind them. But I found it very interesting that very emphatically what the, what the name Adulam means is a place of testimony. Can I say those places of desperation, those places of darkness do turn into places of destiny? How you respond in those places will become a testimony of your character and how God can use you in other places. With God's help, I want to preach on this little thought this morning. I want to preach on finding God in your dark place. You know that Job said man's days are few and full of trouble. You know that Mm, as you look around this world, this world's full of a lot of darkness. Can I say there are a lot of people facing a lot of dark things? Isn't it amazing with all the COVID talk, how little talk there's been of uh, other issues that were magne magnified not long ago? How about the opioid crisis? Has heroin just disappeared? <coughs> Do you remember, excuse me, just last year, how they was wanting communities to act, you know, become active and, and, and fighting the heroin epidemic and fighting the opioid crisis. Uh, uh, can I tell you that still at Boone County Courthouse, 90% uh, uh, of the cases that come before are heroin related, uh, but we don't hear about that anymore. Whether it's a virus, whether it's a opioid crisis, whether it's a, 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 any other crisis that's going on, whether it's the abortion crowd, uh, whether it's a, 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 the child abuse crowd, uh, whether it's anything else going on, it seems like this world is full of darkness. You can strive to live a good life, a clean life, be good to your neighbors, work your job, uh, uh, pay your bills, do everything right, and it still seems like there is a cloud of darkness in this world. So how do we find God in our dark place? Can I say, it's one thing to just look around and see, it's another thing when darkness sets in on you. Can I say you can live right, walk right, spit right, do everything right, and still face some dark times? Now I know that as Baptists we're supposed to you know, talk about how great everything is all the time. But life is hard. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes terrible things happen to God's people. Darkness can come. How do you find God in your darkness? I already alluded to the fact of where David had been. We're talking about David. The apple of God's eye is hiding in a cave. A man after God's own heart is in a cave. How do you find God in your dark place? Well, in order to find God in your dark place, first of all, you've got to adjust your sight. Now, I have kind of a condition when it gets dark very sudden, I have a hard time seeing. Miss Annette loves riding with me at night when it's raining. <laughs> Just something about it's hard to make things out in the dark. You've got to learn to adjust your sight because what happens usually when things get dark, you start looking around. In the midst of your darkness... The devil is real quick to point out folks that are doing real good. Or the devil's real quick to point out faults in others and they're not in a dark place, but yet you are. He wants uh, very emphatically for you to set your sights on anything other than where they need to be set. You've got to learn to adjust your sight because it is very, very easy to fall into a pattern of looking at others and all of a sudden drawing conclusions that you have no idea what is really going on. You'll say, oh, look at 
Clint sitting on that front row. He never has any problems. He thinks he's better than everybody else. Why is he sitting on the front row? He don't need to sit on the front row. Who's he think he is? You'll start thinking all kinds of junk. Now, I promise you, if you talk to him, he'll tell you he's got problems. Hmm? But see, in your darkness, you don't want to see his problems. You want to see him as the, as the problem. He's an enemy of me because he thinks he's better than me. No, he don't. I know the guy. There ain't anybody any more meek and lowly than him. But yet, in your darkness, you'll draw conclusions without any facts. Can I say this, Brother Jack? In your darkness, you'll believe wrong before you believe right. Because when you're in a dark place, you're hurting. And for whatever reason in these human vessels that we have, we tend to find uh, uh, that we can find some kind of solace if we can find somebody else that we can make feel worse than us. You've got to learn to adjust your sight. The Bible says this in Psalms 123. Verse number one, the Bible says, Unto thee lift up mine eyes. That's where you need to focus. That's where you need to adjust your sight. Unto thee lift up mine eyes, O that dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, uh, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, uh, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy on us. Uh, have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, uh, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. And there's our problem. When we're in a dark place, we get filled with contempt. We need to look unto the hills from whence cometh our help. We need to be found guilty of looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I wonder this morning, does your vision need an adjustment? Now listen, I am totally against racism. The Bible makes it clear that God's no respecter of persons. Jesus don't care what color a man is. Jesus cares about their soul. He died for the souls of men, and he tasted death for every man. But can I say this? Black Lives Movement matter is not about black lives. It's about an agenda. They're filled with contempt. Hmm? Most of the places that they are riding and burning down are black homes and black businesses. Right. It's not about race. Right. Can I say when people have their eye on the wrong thing, right. they'll have problems. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could get everybody in America to put their eyes on Jesus? Yeah. The pinnacle of what we should aspire to be? Everybody would love right. Everybody would treat people right. Everybody would be good to everybody. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Amen. You can find God in your dark place. You first of all have to adjust your sight. No matter how good your intention, if you look at somebody else, you're going to be jacked up. If you don't look at Clint in content, but you look at him and say, boy, I wish I had everything he had. I wish I was as blessed as him. I wish, and you put him on a pedestal, you're still doing wrong. Amen. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Whenever you put somebody on a pedestal, you're just daring somebody else to knock them off. You need to adjust your sights to Jesus. Because he's the only one that can really help you. Amen. Can I say, in order to find God in your dark place, you must adjust your sight, but you must also accept your weakness. We get into trouble when we get in dark places when we think we can handle it. When we get filled with pride and we think that we know what is best. The great apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, Therefore I will take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. 
When you admit to God you can't handle it, you are giving God the reins to handle it. You must admit your weakness. Friend, I don't care what it is, there's something that will break every one of us. There's something too big for all of us. Now, what may be too big for you might not be too big for me, and what may be too big for me might not be too big for you, but make no mistake, there is a dark place that you must confront that it is bigger than you. And you must lean on the Lord. Because you'll never get there until you admit your weakness. I would to God that Baptist folks would admit that we're not, you know, where we should be with God. Baptist folks need to adjust their halos. We got the right doctrine. We got the right book. We got the right... Day. Yeah, bless God, we're right. Not a lot of them. Mm. How come they're in revival? Mm. How come there aren't flocks of folks piling in and getting saved? Because we're not really all we claim to be. There's a lot of times in our dark places we want to be actors and act like everything's okay. If you're going to get help and find God in your dark place you got to adjust your sight you got to accept your weakness hmm. can I say this then you got to ask for help we don't like that do we especially if you're a man and you're lost oh, I'm going to stop and ask for directions hmm. every woman shaking her head yeah that's him uh, we don't want to we don't want to ask for help it's a pride thing Again, it gets back to admitting that we're weak. We can't overcome it. We can't do it. It's okay to ask for help. Matter of fact, it shows how strong you are when you ask for help. Hmm. When you come face to face with you don't have all the answers, but I want to find somebody who does. That is a position of strength, friend. The Bible says that there's wisdom in the multitude of counsel. There's nothing wrong with seeking help. But there's the stigmatism that folks don't want to deal with. That you don't have all the answers. It'll be a great day in your life when you realize you're a zero. And Jesus is everything. Mm. You've got to ask for help if you're going to find God in your dark place. The psalmist cried, help, Lord, the godly man sees us. You've got to learn to cry for help. Can I say this? If you're going to find God in your dark place, you have to aspire for light. You can stay in the darkness all you want. But if you start seeking for light, you'll find light. Seeking ye shall find. The Bible says in Psalms 1, uh, Psalm 18, verse 28, For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Uh, Psalms 43, 3, O send out thy light and thy truth, let them lead me, let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Uh, Psalms 112, verse 4, Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. Uh, he is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. You need to aspire for the light. There's light for your darkness. Why grope in the darkness when you can have the light of God lead you in paths for His name's sake? Can I say this? You've got to aspire for light. Everybody knows this old adage. You can lead a horse to water, but you... It amazes me how many people, Brother Phil, will come on Sunday and hear preaching, but they will never put it into effect in their life. They just want to stay in darkness. Hmm? That's why so many are so negative, because they want somebody else to be negative, because misery loves company. Hmm? When folks are excited about Jesus, that becomes infectious too, by the way. Amen. I'm trying to help you this morning to find God in your darkness. You've got to adjust your sight. You've got to accept your weakness. You've got to ask for help. You've got to aspire for light. But then I find this, you've got to wait on the answers. We are impatient people. Guilty. Uh, 
God blessed the foster household with two things. Number one, a lot of confidence. Number two, no patience. Nobody in our house has any patience. We just don't have it. We don't want it. Don't pray for me to get patience. I don't want to go through the tribulation to get the patience. But I'm going to help you something. You're not going to find God in your dark place where you're trying to run around to get out of the dark. After you've asked him for help, after you've aspired for the light, you've got into the light, the Bible says the entrance of thy word giveth light unto all the house. So once you aspire to the light, you've got to wait on the answers. Yes, sir. Huh? The Bible says in Psalms 86, 7, In the day of my trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Psalm 91, 15, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Psalm 118, verse 5, the very middle verse of the Bible, the very middle two words of the Bible is the Lord. It says, I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord, right there it is, the middle of the Bible, answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord will answer. You've got to wait on it. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Sometimes God gets us in a dark place so we'll cut out all the noise of the world so we'll listen to Him. You can find God in your dark place and the dark place might be the very place God is waiting for you to get to. See, while you're on the mountaintop while everything's going good, while everything's wonderful, you're running around like a chicken with his head cut off. Even when you're in the valley, a lot of times you're still skirmishing around. But when you're in a cave, there's no place to go. Let me say this and I'll be done. In David's dark place, this is what he found. Can I say, first of all, he found a refuge. He is running from Saul, but at the cave Adulam, he found refuge. Sometimes God gets you alone by yourself so God can spend some time with you. And those alone times with God will be the most important and the most wonderful times in your life. He found a refuge. Can I say this? He found rest. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. We are so stressed out and we are so uh, 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 spread thin that we can't rest in what God has done for us. I watch it every Sunday. You have spent all week doing everything you've got to do. You've got to work. You've got to get your yard work done. You've got to get your shopping done. You've got to get the kids here and get the kids there. You've got this going on, that going on, this going on. You finally get to church on Sunday and you sit down. It's the first time you've rested all week. And many times you just zone out. And you can't get help from God because you have no rest in your life. The rest of God brings the peace of God. He found rest in that cave. All the fretting and worrying about what Saul was going to do, he found not only a refuge, he found rest, but can I say this? In that cave he found reinforcements. You know that distressed, deaded, discontent crowd? You know how that crowd became some of the greatest warriors that have ever donned a sword and armor in the history of mankind? He found reinforcements. They still talk about David's mighty men of valor. We're talking three of them whipped a whole garrison of Philistines. We're talking about mighty men that became reinforcements for David who went on to serve uh, in his court when he became king. He found reinforcements in that cave. He found revival in that cave. He came out of that cave different than he went in that cave. He's a different man. Now let me say this. David had already been anointed king. But David came out of that cave and became king. God has already ordained you a priest and a king in his kingdom. But when you come out of a dark place, you start living up to your titles. You start becoming that which God has ordained you to already be. A vessel that makes an impact in this world for His glory. Now I wonder, are you in a dark place today? 
If you are, you're in a good place because you can find God in this place today. He can help you. Maybe you're in the darkness of sin. The Bible says if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Lest the glorious light of the gospel should shine unto them. See, the devil keeps people lost in darkness. He wants them to think their religion is good enough. He wants them to think their works is good enough. He wants them to think their life is good enough. He wants them to think that when it all ends, uh, uh, that God's going to take all their good points and all their bad points, and if their good points outweigh their bad points, they get to go to heaven. All makes sense to the human mind. Our reasoning, when it doesn't line up with what the Bible says. The Bible says there's none that doeth good. No, not one. The Bible says all of our righteousness, all the good things we'll do in all of our life is as filthy rags in the sight of God. It's not about our righteousness. It's about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why God sent him to the cross to shed his blood because it took his blood to cleanse us from our sins. Uh, and then, Brother Clint, he robes us in his righteousness. Uh, so when I stand before God, it's not what I've done, it's what he's done for me. But the devil wants to keep folks in darkness. He just takes some of the truths of God and he twists them a little bit and people have gotten caught up in the twist. And they're going to miss God. One of the saddest things that Jesus said was in Matthew 7, when he said, In that day many shall come to me and profess, Lord, did we not do many marvelous things in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do all these things in your name? He says, Depart from me, ye that worked iniquity. I never knew you. It's not about what we do. It's about who we know. You better know him. I'm glad I have a relationship with him and I know him. I talk to him and he talks to me. I'm glad for what I have in Christ. Maybe you're in darkness today. Darkness of sin. I've got good news. Jesus can save you and bring you into the light. Maybe you're here today, you've been saved. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. You know that you know that you know to your say, but it seems like everything you touch falls apart. It seems like you're, you just can't get any victory, can't get any joy. You're in a good place. Maybe today you need to come and ask for some help. You say, well, I've called on God. Well, maybe today you need to admit to God that you can't handle it, and you need to call on Him. Maybe you're here today, and you're not in that kind of a dark place, but you're just in a dark place. You want to know God's will for your life. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Why don't you come and say, God, what do you want out of my life? You know, I don't know what your need is, but I know there's a lot of darkness in this world. And I know sometimes God puts us in a cave so that we can see his glorious light in our life. Maybe today God's got you where he's, where he's got you because he wants you to look up and see him. You've been looking everywhere else. Look to him. I've got news for you. It doesn't matter if it's Democrat, Republican, Libertarian. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. What matters is who's sitting on the throne. And is he, is he sitting on the throne of your heart? Are you looking to him today? I know one thing. You can find God in your dark place. Are you looking for him today? If so, you can find him. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, get your guitar. Just pick out something for an invitation. If you're here today and you're not saved, if you come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. You can be saved from your sin today. If you're here today and you're saved and in a dark place, I highly recommend calling on God and finding some light in your dark place. If you're here today and any other reason, these altars are open. You can come talk to God. That's what it's about. He's getting ready to play something. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for these that have already come. Lord, you know the need of every heart. God, those that are seeking your will, I pray you'd manifest it to them. Those that are seeking some help, I pray you'd help them. Lord, I pray for anybody here today unsaved, they'd come and put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I pray you'd work in this invitation. I pray you'd help folks in the midst of their darkness. I pray you'd strengthen folks. Those that are on the mountaintop, God, I pray you'd do something great for them. And God, I pray we'd see you high and lifted up in our lives. 
Bless now this invitation. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.